In Zoroastrian theology, the universe is seen as a constant conflict between the fundamental laws which order the universe and the forces of deceit and deception which oppose and obstruct them. In the context of this conflict, reality is seen as a progression toward a perfect, ideal reality that, while occasionally regressing due to the forces of deception, will inevitably reach its best state. These laws of the universe were established by the all-wise creator, Mazda Ahura, who then created reality through the incremental progression of these fundamental principles, and now actively maintains them and fights against the forces of deception. This creator of existence has seven aspects or emanations which make up its person, and which aid its efforts in perfecting reality. In our own attempts to perfect our reality and be like our creator, we are to seek after and attain these seven aspects. These aspects are called the Ameshaspentas, and their totality would represent a complete and perfect reality, a utopia in our limited understanding. The nature of Mazda Ahura is hard to exactly say. In some ways it can be analogous to the Abrahamic God, although its nature in many ways is different. Some tend to consider it as emerging out of a cosmic struggle of good versus evil, for which it created reality in order to finally eliminate evil, while others consider it as all of reality as a whole, which is going through its own perfection process, imminent in all of existence. Yet I feel the most prevalent understanding is that Mazda Ahura existed before all of reality and created it through the laws of existence, which it was the progenitor of. Evil, wrong, is of course not permitted by Mazda Ahura and is actively opposed by the creator through those laws of existence. It is this very conflict which leads to the necessity of Mazda Ahura, who created reality to progressively advance, or evolve, to perfection. In this conflicted world, understanding the nature of its creator, and its intent, is of the utmost importance. The nature of the creator starts with the name used for it. Mazda Ahura is not necessarily a proper name, but a descriptive one, a compound of two words meant to describe its nature. Mazda literally means wisdom. It is a feminine noun in the Avestan language and its use represents personification of wisdom, or, more accurately, the being whose nature is best understood as personifying wisdom. This is the actual name used for the creator, and historically, Zoroastrians would frequently use Mazda, or wisdom in English, as the name for their god. The word Ahura means Lord most simply in its usage, although its actual meaning is more complex. Ahura is a masculine noun in Avestan. It is a compound of two root words, which together mean something like the establisher of life or the maintainer of existence. It is used mainly as an epithet for wisdom, but also can be used for anything seeking to strive after wisdom, usually as an adjective. There is an argument floating around the internet that there is a class of being called Ahuras, but this is a misunderstanding. Ahura is an adjective or title used for a being who has worked toward the good of existence, the first of which is Mazda. There perhaps may be many more Ahuras, made up of the many good and noble humans who are living, who have ever lived, and who will live. Mazda Ahura, or alternately Ahura Mazda, should be understood as Lord Wisdom fully the all-wise establisher of existence. Its name helps us to realize its nature, one of ultimate wisdom, a name chosen for a specific reason. The way we best seek to know Lord Wisdom is through our own pursuit of understanding, knowledge, and wisdom. As a concept, wisdom is of course the highest of all mental faculties. It is both the full realization and the synthesis of such other concepts as thinking, understanding, creativity, reasoning, and intellect. It is through our own pursuit of these faculties that we find wisdom, and it is by the pursuit of wisdom that we begin to understand the Creator, Lord Wisdom, who first established these things. Since for us wisdom, you first made our lives and conceptions and intellects by your thinking, because you did make us body and breath, 
since you also made actions, teachings, whereby one expresses their preferences at will. What is also of note is the gender of Lord Wisdom. As I subtly referred to earlier, the names Ahura and Mazda are masculine and feminine, and together as Ahura Mazda indicate that wisdom is both masculine and feminine. The implications of this is that wisdom is both genders, but also neither. Masculine, feminine, and neutral. In Zoroastrian philosophy, gender has never played the same dividing role that it has in other traditions. Masculine and feminine are seen as fundamentally equal, with both having their own unique advantages. This understanding of gender is a common one in Zoroastrianism. Women are spiritually equal to men, and in the earlier days were socially equal to men as well a concept us modern Zoroastrians have been working to revive. Yet gender is only a clue to the nature of Lord Wisdom, although it does point to a deeper understanding of Mazda. That is, it indicates the diversity of the constituent parts of Wisdom. In our endeavors to explain Wisdom in this age, we seek to describe it in many ways. We say it comes from life experience, Understanding that a person who has done much in their life, and who has had much happen to them, oftentimes negative and tragic experiences, has gained wisdom from these experiences. We also understand that wisdom is in someone who has learned to detach from the world in ways that gives them clarity on its workings. Due to a sense of impartiality, they can understand the ways things work in a truer sense and speak to greater connections and reasons than most people are capable of. People who have found more clarity on the issue may say that wisdom is a property in people who have the ability to think deeply and broadly about life. Some are born this way, and others learn it through experiencing a storied life. Such is the importance of the crucible of that sort of life which can impart wisdom onto people. But many who have such a life never turn out to be wise. It is perhaps then a vague mixture of a person's disposition and their life experiences. As a type of mental faculty, wisdom is often understood by our society as one of the highest virtues, combining the best parts of creativity, thinking, reasoning, and life experiences. I on occasion hear people say that it is just in relation to understanding life experiences, not to intellects or thinking but I don't hold this opinion in much regard. As I mentioned earlier, I see wisdom as the highest of all mental faculties, the culmination of other such ones. Perhaps I am overstating my own perspective, but I feel this is how most people tend to see it. To illustrate what I mean, a wise intellectual, as rare as that may be, would be a much greater intellectual to most people than a regular one, or even a foolish one. Nor would saying, a wise person doesn't have a similar capacity to an intellectual, be very accurate. Nevertheless, there is perhaps more to wisdom than just this. This wisdom from intellectual faculties. We live in a fundamentally ethical world, where the very order of existence is inherently good, if not yet fully realized. This is, at least, from a Zoroastrian understanding. Wisdom would then be the understanding of this true nature of reality and the traits needed to navigate and perfect such a reality. To truly find wisdom, one would need to discover, understand, and acquire these traits that would help us advance reality to its best existence. This conception of wisdom is what we Zoroastrians mean when we say that the creator of existence is Lord Wisdom. And this conception is what I imply when I say that wisdom is made up of seven aspects. The dual usage of these words is intentional, and the very traits one would need to act in this ethical world are the very aspects which make up the all-wise creator of the universe. The name that has survived for these seven aspects of wisdom is the Amesha Spentas, a name meaning the benevolent immortals, a later term. The Amesha Spentas have puzzled many modern scholars who have been unable to see past their Judeo-Christian and Western ways of thinking. And they are puzzling indeed. When reading the ancient texts, they can be alternately seen as independent spiritual entities and as faculties that humans use and seek after. 
Some tend to take this as them being personalized for poetic effect. And while I think this may well be true, I feel the intention may be that they were always distinct entities, yet ultimately only aspects of the creator, an idea worth exploring. As distinct entities, the Amesha Spintas make up the whole of Mazda Ahura and can operate individually or collectively. As a collective, they are originally referred to by the plural form of Lord Wisdom's name, which would be pronounced as Mazdasha Ahuranko, or the Lords of Wisdom in English. To quote the founder Zarathustra, And then, may we be those who would make this existence new. And may the Lords of Wisdom be on to me, with united support and with Asha, so that our minds may be focused whenever our understanding is in doubt. Their purpose is to aid Lord Wisdom and us all in progressing reality by actualizing the order of existence. To do this, the evils of the world which spring from the ultimate deception must be eliminated. As such, their importance is in making this world brilliant, aiding the living beings dedicated to the truth and goodness. If our existence is ever to be made new, then it would be by the aid of these benevolent beings. But more so, their true nature lies in being sought after. The fact that all of them are at most the personification of component mental or societal traits tells us that. And their true value comes in the benefits and abilities they grant those who seek after them. Zarathustra himself hints at this. When I might call upon Asha, and the Lords of Wisdom appear, along with the rewarding right-mindedness, I will seek with the best thinking for myself the mighty rule, through whose growth we may overcome the deception. Their true benefit comes in benefiting those who wish to progress reality. And in fact, that is what they fundamentally are. A full list that gives a dedicated person a process or formula on how to perfect our reality. How to make existence new. In all these ways, the Amesha Spintas represent many different philosophical outlooks on mankind, reality, and creator. And understanding their nature would give us all a better understanding on how to improve our own lives and societies. The first Amesha Spinta is Vohumana, the good mind. The good mind represents the ability to think, reason, imagine, feel, and to be creative, particularly in a way that promotes the good. The good mind is the most diverse Amesha Spinta because both good and mind represent so many different ideas in Zoroastrian philosophy. But as a whole, the good mind is what allows us to come up with solutions to the problems we face and to enjoy, appreciate, and celebrate the good things in life. We use the good mind by actively thinking and creating throughout our lives. As we live in a fundamentally flawed existence, many bad and wrongful people have done terrible things in order to benefit. Because of such actions, Many more people have been led to do wrongful things because they are deceived by the structures incidentally set up by those people. The effects of all this has led to many flawed and broken structures that contribute to wrongful thinking permeating throughout humanity. Because of this, it is then our responsibility to use our good minds to recognize the many flaws in our reality, and to begin to come up with solutions in an active way. In the Avestan language, the good mind is used in a very active and instrumental way. So the term good thinking, with the understanding that this thinking means all mental processes, is more appropriate. When we use this good thinking, we will be able to identify and address these issues, both societally and personally. Where are your sincere ones who, wisdom, by their obtainment of good thinking, make even disastrous decrees and painful legacies disappear. But how exactly are we to know whether we are on the right path? What gives credence to our own thinking? These questions lead to the truth that good thinking cannot be separated from a term called Asha. I have actually been referring to Asha throughout this video as the order of existence, 
And that is what it most accurately is. Asha is that fundamental principle, or principles, which orders and regulates existence. In a sense, it bears a lot of similarities with the modern concept of the laws of physics or the laws of science, that while not technically a real thing in science, is a very useful concept for many scientists and lay people. Asha is often described as truth, but this isn't the ultimate meaning of the word, just a way of understanding it. Most accurately, it is the very laws of existence which dictate how the universe operates. This is how it is the truth, more so in the sense that Asha is the ultimate source of truth, not the concept itself. This is where the source of our good thinking is from. When we need to use our good thinking, it both comes from Asha and is turned to Asha in order to understand how things ideally ought to be ordered. The good in the good mind, Vohu, alternately Vengayush, represents everything in existence in our own minds which is from Asha, that order of existence. Unlike other religious traditions, the good is not necessarily spiritual, but material and mental. The mental of course being where spirituality arises from in this philosophical tradition. The good is then everything which promotes life or makes life worth enjoying. The necessity of thinking comes from when these goods are hard to find or are thwarted for only one person's benefit. So when in times of necessity, we use our good thinking to promote life and fix issues. But in times of goodness and benefit, we use our good thinking to enjoy, celebrate, and enhance the good. As an aspect of Mazda Ahura, Vohumana is the first of the seven. It is what Mazda used to create the order of existence, through which reality incrementally progressed to its current state, which is described later. It is by his own thinking and intellect that Lord Wisdom designed the universe and everything good in it as well as its path to ultimate goodness and perfection. And as we are only in this temporary state of strife, imperfection, a mixture of good and bad, it is this good thinking which wisdom grants to us as support, as we see in multiple places throughout the teachings of Zarathustra. Would you, Lord, grant them strength and rule through Asha? Through good thinking, grant that by which one may bring peace and tranquility. I myself, Wisdom, have realized you as a first achiever of that. Although the spattering of other mentions throughout gives us a clearer picture. Be for us, Lord Wisdom, the revealer of good thinking. All of life under your rule, which you have nourished with good thinking. What help through Asha do you have for Zarathustra who calls? What help by good thinking have you for me? It is Vahumana which watches over humanity and protects it and gives it benefit. But Vahumana clearly means good thinking, and in the end, it is solely the good thinking of Lord Wisdom. It is by this process that Lord Wisdom chooses the best solutions to mankind's issues and helps us all. And it is by aiding us in our own obtaining of the good mind that this aspect of wisdom is made clear. The second Amesha Spinta is Asha, the order of existence, the laws of the universe. Asha is the ultimate principle which dictates how the universe operates. It isn't some sort of invisible guiding hand or direct force, but that subtle thing from which everything derives. It is the ultimate source of everything good, true, and worthy of being admired, yet it is very rarely fully realized. In later tradition, it is repeatedly referred to as Asha Vahishta, the most good order of existence. It is called so because Asha is the ultimate good, and if it were fully realized, the result would be something that is best. In Zoroastrianism, good exists on a spectrum from good, more good, to most good. The most good, Vahishta, is then what is perfect, ideal, or highest, a good which cannot be improved, the ultimate goal. The order of existence is called most good because the very laws of our universe were designed to be perfect and to lead to a perfect existence. 
But Asha is opposed by the deception, which has caused the yet incomplete actualization of Asha in existence. While I covered this struggle in depth in the previous video, what's important for this discussion is that the order of existence will inevitably win, and it is our responsibility as humans to use our thinking to actualize it. Once Asha is fully realized for all of existence, it would lead to the best existence, a truly ideal, perfect reality. This I ask you, tell me truly, Lord, is the beginning of the best existence in such a way that a loving man who shall seek after these things is to receive benefit? The existence in which we live now is often referred to as a first existence. The existence in which the order of existence is not fully realized. An existence in which the deception exists. Yet, as I said, it has the potential to be perfected if a Shah, the laws of the universe, were fully understood. This is why Asha is often called the truth. Because the ultimate source of truth is this very dictating principle from which our universe was born. From this understanding, truth, goodness, and beauty are all fundamentally derived from Asha, and Zoroastrian thinking tells us to seek after and understand the laws of existence if we are to know what would be good or most good. Beauty, which philosophers tend to call aesthetics, ultimately derives from Asha because our appreciation of what is beautiful is based on how Asha is realized within an object or idea. Yet the very nature of Asha is to expand and diversify in a kaleidoscopic way, which the scholar of Zoroastrianism Dina McIntyre has demonstrated in her work. While I will leave Zoroastrian aesthetics for another time, what is important to understand is that everything good and wonderful ultimately derives from Asha and its ultimate realization wouldn't be a single uniform and monotonous good, but an extremely diverse and complex beauty. It is this realization or actualization of Asha Vahishta, the most good order of existence, that is the ultimate goal of Zoroastrians and humanity in general. How this would be done is a question indeed. Yet Zarathustra does tell us that a solution was given by Mazda Ahura embedded in the very laws of existence. Just how it is actualized here through these, the laws of this first existence, that solution is actualized by a most honorable action. It is for both the unethical and ethical, and of whose faults are considered together with his virtues. The solution is what would bring to realization Asha and the best existence. While this understanding of Asha Vahishta is somewhat tangential, it is critical for understanding its true nature. Asha, while operating throughout all of existence as a whole, also operates individually in plant and animal life, humans, people groups, and more. As an aspect of Lord Wisdom, it represents its entire ultimate goodness. In a sense, Lord Wisdom is Asha personified, but to be more accurate, Asha is wholly realized within its person. In a more complete understanding, it is the way in which Ahura Mazda operates within the universe, one of two to be precise. The other is derived from Asha and is alas a Meshaspenta. Frequently in Zoroastrian literature is Mazda described as acting through Asha, the laws of existence. In fact, the very term Asha denotes the instrumental nature of the word. When Asha is acting in its own accord, or is being referred to as a static object, one would say Ashim. One would only say Asha when something is done by or through Asha. This shows that the very way we remember Asha is in this use of it. Lord Wisdom is described as the father of this order of existence and it is indeed the very way in which it acts through our mortal existence. As Zarathustra himself describes many times, it is through the laws of existence by which Mazda Ahura would grant us aid. In our individual lives and as something to be acquired, Asha is to be searched after and understood. In our bodies, it represents a fully healthy and capable body. In our minds, it represents a mind which is entirely set right fully adjusted to any assaults from this flawed world it has experienced. In our societies, it represents a utopia. 
It is our responsibility as humans to seek to understand it and to model it to the best of our ability in our professions, hobbies, personal lives, and endeavors. In our pursuit of knowledge, understanding, or truth, it is Asha which is our ultimate justification and font of truth. By seeking to understand and emulate Asha, we begin to acquire it within ourselves and help spread it to others. In this world, we often are encountered with situations in which our actions alone are incapable of affecting change. We have limited capability to enact our will or even to protect our own well-being. Encountered by this, we lack ability and often are in need of banding together into societies. In all these circumstances, it is power that we seek. The power to protect ourselves and our families. The power to enact our understanding and the power to prevent the unethical from destroying our world. It is by this power we wish to enact rule over our lives, and even over other people and things within our lives. Yet as the demands of this world increased, no one person's ability alone was enough. It was by this power that we originally created our societies, and it is by this power which they are still upheld today. By this, we can begin to understand Kshatra, the rule. Kshatra is both rule in the sense of rulership of society, as well as the ability to affect our rule in reality. The third in Meshaspinta is Vahu Kshatra, the good rule, although later tradition remembered it as Kshatra Vairya, the rule to be chosen or the desirable dominion. The word rule is very versatile in its use. In a clear sense, it means the structure contained of laws and dictates which govern systems. This applies to systems in our individual lives, communities, societies, and existence at large, as well as anything in between. Although it is most presciently used in reference to the societal and governmental systems that we construct to rule over us. This understanding of rule comes from the ability to have power to enact one's will as well as the general state of having this power over a social group. As we are destined to live in societies that are governed, it is the search for the good rule that is of such a great importance. In the end, we are only one person. We can only achieve so much individually. We must seek to perfect our societies and harness the ability to do good of our societies. It is our responsibility to search after and actualize this good rule in our societies. That good rule must be chosen which best brings good fortune to the man serving it with great things. In alliance with Asha, it will encompass the most good through its actions wisdom. This very rule shall I now bring to realization for us. The good rule is in essence the rule of Asha in good thinking, which is echoed in many places. It is all of our responsibilities as thinking beings to evaluate the societies that we live in. We ought to look at the structures of the world and ask whether they are fair and equal. Are they good? Do they benefit everyone? Do they oppress people, either by direct opposition or by dysfunctional systems? Moreover, we must not settle for an okay or just fine society. No matter how good we think our societies are, they always are in need of improvement. Moreover, we are often blind to the large minorities that don't have the same experience we do in more privileged positions in our societies. Only one far from wisdom would wait for cataclysmic events to show them their society was insufficient. The good rule can be epitomized as one in which the laws of existence has been fully actualized within, a society in which the best way to order things has been found. It is sought after by good thinking, with which we evaluate our societies, and notice areas that are in need of change. By this good thinking, we also have the creativity needed to create new ways of actualizing Asha in our societies. So this good rule would be one in which the order of existence was best actualized through the efforts of our intellects and creativities. Kshatra is also more personal. It is the ability to actualize our own will in our lives. By good rule, it can mean the power to have rulership in one's existence which is good, brings good to others, 
and is maintained through good, beneficial means. As an aspect of Lord Wisdom, this is how it is. Vohu Kshatra is a rule which Ahura Mazda grants to humanity to aid it in its own pursuits of the good rule. But it is also the means by which wisdom rules over those in his care. As an aspect of wisdom, the good rule is perhaps best understood by Mazda's beneficence, best demonstrated by these excerpts. All of life under your rule, which you have nourished with good thinking. Through your rule, Lord, you would truly make this existence new, by your will. Grant me that wish for a long life, and that wish for the desirable condition which is said to exist under your rule. Such is your rule, wisdom, through which you shall grant what is very good to your needy dependent who lives honestly. As an independent entity, it is actually hard to say. As in all the works of Zarathustra, it is not personalized to any effect. It is instead best understood through Asha, Fahumana, and Lord Wisdom, and is the culmination of all three. It is the means by which they are accomplished and fully actualized and it is the means by which they enact their power. But most importantly, it is the means by which Lord Wisdom cares for us. Because those who are alive, and those who have been, and those who will be, shall seek after the benefit that comes from Him, the one who offers solicitude, that the soul of the ethical person would be powerful in immortality that woes beset the unethical mortals in an enduring fashion. These things, too, did Lord Wisdom create by reason of his rule. With the triad of Asha, Vahumana, and Lord Wisdom, accompanied by their rule, do we have a full system for making existence new. We have Asha, the very order of existence, which we understand and actualize by reason of Vahumana, our good thinking. By understanding these, we establish the rule of these two, by the will of Lord Wisdom. Moreover, this gives us an understanding of the creation of existence. Mazda used his thinking to craft Asha, the laws of the universe, by which existence was given birth, and by which the rule of Asha must be established for it to be realized. This triad, along with Vohu Khathra, represents what could be understood as a complete understanding of Lord Wisdom, and in the text is the most prescient expression of Mazda's aspects. As of now, the gender of Lord Wisdom is both feminine and masculine, and the grammatical gender of the rest has been neutral. While this system may seem complete, in a sense, there must be more. Exactly how was reality created through Asha? By what force did the laws of the universe unfold into our current existence? Must we, as Zoroastrians, be constantly thinking, hyper-evaluating every situation to see if it is in line with an infinitely complex conception of truth? How are we to achieve spiritual or emotional fulfillment in life? Is there life after death? I ask these rhetorical questions like the number 7 isn't already ingrained in your head like the revelation of there being more Meshaspentas is some sort of surprise. But I think it's important to note the separation between the first three and the final four. The first four form a complete pyramid, with a shah at the top. Yet by adding the last four, we form a larger pyramid, one whose order is changed. And by the complete list, we have a whole picture of how to perfect our world and find happiness. And we can begin to understand exactly how Mazda Ahura created the universe, and why it's in the current state that it is now. Of all the aspects of Lord Wisdom, there is one which has the best case for being its own distinct entity. It shows a new understanding of life, and a new expression of the intrinsic goodness of reality. It represents our natural instinct to set things right and the underlying drive to do good. It is by this Amesha Spinta that the underlying structures of belief we hold are reformed and educated. Her name is Spinta Aramaiti, Benevolent Right-Mindedness. Aramaiti also happens to be the Amesha Spinta whose name is in the most dispute, 
with some even claiming this word hasn't been accurately decoded yet. So forgive this brief linguistic discussion. A similar figure called Aramati appears in ancient Sanskrit texts. This connection is important as Hinduism and Zoroastrianism share a common origin. And Zarathustra made his religious innovations in an environment not much different from what's called Vedic Hinduism. In fact, without the similarity, much of the linguistic decoding of Zoroastrian texts would not have been possible. And we wouldn't be able to uncover this philosophy to nearly the extent that we have. In Sanskrit, Aramati means piety or devotion. And some scholars have translated Spenta Aramati as such although this meaning clearly doesn't fit its usage. My personal theory is that both these words had a common origin with a broader meaning, and the Sanskrit usage began to narrow with time. I will also not mention the Sanskrit name again, as I don't want to confuse you with how similar these two words sound. But to the meaning of Aramaiti, there have been many different reconstructions of this word, so I will present you with the one I think makes the most sense in the context of which it is used. I believe it was Helmut Humbach, one of the great linguists of Zoroastrianism, who first connected this word to the meaning right-mindedness. It is a compound of two stems, ar or ara, meaning right, but more accurately to set right, to fix, and maiti, which comes from the root man, meaning mind, or to think, which is cognate with the Latin root men, to think, from whence we have the word mentality. What's important is the first part of this word, right. The root R comes from the root ert, which is extremely consequential. This root means to set in place, to fix, and also what fits. It formed the word arta, which morphed into a sha over time, and was used in the sense of what sets things in place, eventually abstracted out to the fundamental principle ordering all of reality. It also forms the word retouche, meaning a judgment or solution given to set a situation right. In the word Aramaiti, we can then understand what right-mindedness really means. It is a mind that has been set right. That is, a mind which has been set on doing the right things. A mind that is inspired to do good. This means as an entity, it is what inspires people or what sets people's minds on doing what they are supposed to. Hence in Sanskrit, it can mean piety. Yet in Avestan, the Zoroastrian language, it still has a more general usage. I'm not a linguist, but I'd like to propose an alternate way of understanding this meaning. Perhaps instead of just a mind that is set right, it can also mean a mind that sets things right. That is, a mind that is inspired to correct the faults in this world. The only way to prove the exact meaning of this word is to evaluate it in context, so keep that in mind. The word spinta is significantly easier. It either has a meaning of progressive, expanding, or beneficial, benevolent. I'll cover this word more later, but for now it means both. It is used as an optional epithet or adjective of Aramaiti, and alternates in appearing in her name. This meaning, for the sake of understanding right-mindedness, represents the natural benevolence of those who are pure of heart and convicted in action, which easily spreads to those who encounter them. Right-mindedness is then that inspiring force that causes us to do good when we encounter situations. It is not the thought of doing it, or the thought process behind it, but the very act itself, preceded by the instinct. It is by right-mindedness we actualize Asha for all of reality. We cannot always rely on having the time to think, or even whether our thoughts will inevitably lead us to doing what is best. In many circumstances, we must simply have that internal desire to help, to love, to improve, and to inspire. Through its actions, right-mindedness gives substance to Asha, it has made clear to you the rule of good thinking. It is then our mighty which makes real the other aspects, as it so often is associated with actions. It is by actions stemming from our right-mindedness that we work toward making our existence best. But right-mindedness is also what is most pertinent in our individual daily lives. 
While we occasionally encounter situations that require us to come up with creative solutions to bring the situation closer to Asha, that is, the ideal, it is in nearly every day of our lives that we need the presence of right-mindedness to just cause us to do good. Whether this is by volunteering, helping the less fortunate in your cities, or just by being a supportive and loving friend and community member, it is all inspired by Spinta RMIT. By opening our hearts, it begins to incrementally spread within us. As I'm sure you have experienced in your own life, just by lowering your own guard in order to do nice things for people, you will be filled with that feeling which inspires you to continue to do good things for people. And it is by hurtful events that we raise our guard again and begin to abandon right-mindedness. Yet by continuing to be inspired by right-mindedness, do we spread this instinct to others. By actions of right-mindedness does it begin to spread throughout the world. It is almost contagious, at times, to feel inspired to do good when we see others doing the same. Yet I feel that is a bit too common of an understanding, and a bit basic. As like the other Amesha Spintas, our Mighty diversifies out in its own multifaceted way. It is a very flawed nature of our world whereby just doing good, just helping where you can is utterly insufficient. The world has seen a million pure-hearted activists, volunteers, and helpers who, while working toward the renewal of existence in their own way, were only helplessly chipping away at broken human systems and unethical ways of operating. It is by that second connotation that we can find a deeper meaning of this word. Right-mindedness is then that mind which is determined to set things right with the world. It is the part that inspires one to use their good mind to understand the order of existence and therefore actualize the change which is needed. It is the part that demands justice, but not necessarily justice for petty crimes. It is a part that demands justice for harmful societal structures and unethical rulers. It is by this that we have a strong sense of social justice in Zoroastrianism, an overall idea which the Zoroastrian philosopher Katie Irani proposed so well. And this is true indeed. It was Zarathustra who decreed that the rulers of his society, along with the religious establishment and even the very gods, were all evil and unethical. He was the first to call for a society that ought to be run by the rule of Asha and good thinking. And in this current age, he would encourage us to be inspired to correct our societies if they truly are unethical. As an aspect of Lord Wisdom, Spinta Armaiti represents this very thing I have mentioned, that inspiring force causing us to correct and heal our existence. It is Armaiti which causes Mazda to grant his aid to us, through Asha of course. She is often poetically described as a daughter of Lord Wisdom, who is there described as a father of good thinking. She grants to mortals the courage, strength, and inspiration to have action which affects change. Therefore one raises their voice, whether speaking falsely or speaking truthfully, whether knowing or not knowing, with both their heart and mind. One after the other, right-mindedness deliberates with one's mentality when there is conflict. For most of the audience listening, Christianity, or a similar Abrahamic religion, has been dominant in their social milieu. In these religions, the religion is often referred to in shorthand as the faith, using the importance of faith or belief in a higher power as a signifier of the religion. In our more secularized, modern world, we have used our understanding of Christianity and applied it to religions in general in a scientific or academic sense. We have since begun to see religion solely as something one believes in, something that requires faith from someone. And while those are component parts of all religions, they are also component parts of technological and scientific fields as well. Yet many Westerners continue to see all religions like Abrahamic ones, in clear contrast to the very many religions that focus on other factors like behavior, community, or identity. In Zoroastrianism, a very similar process happened with a different word, dina, meaning conceptions. By conceptions, I mean those underlying mental structures by which we see the world. More simply, the way one looks at the world. The words envisionment, worldview, or outlook give some clarity to its meaning. 
As time went on, Zoroastrians began to refer to their religion as their conception. Because of them, it wasn't about belief as much as it was about their mental conceptions. The word eventually was used to refer to religion as a whole, signifying they saw other people's religions as making up their conceptions, much like their own did. It is these conceptions which are also inspired by right-mindedness, a frequent sentiment. RMIT teaches us the best way to look at things, to view things. How might right-mindedness separately come to those to whom your conception is taught, wisdom? Clearly, benevolent right-mindedness, educate my conceptions through Asha. It's because of this sentiment that I feel understanding our mighty as a mind that sets things right is accurate. It is by right-mindedness that we learn to look at the world in an accurate way. It is right-mindedness that inspires us to search after Asha, to obtain good thinking, and to establish the good rule. It is by having conceptions, or worldviews, that are educated by the order of existence, that we don't placidly accept the world in which we live without analysis. It is by these conceptions that we view the world as a struggle towards perfection. And it is by these conceptions that we feel inspired to set things towards the ideal. By which action, by which word, by which celebration, may I obtain immortality and asha for us wisdom, as well as the rule of wholeness, the whole of which is offered to you, Lord, by the greatest number of us. The next two Amesha Spintas are wholeness and immortality, Horvatat and Ameritat. Unlike the rest so far, these two are less aspects as they are attainments. They represent those two ultimate things we wish for in life and the two aspects of Ahura Mazda, which make up its radiance and eternalness. While they are grammatically feminine, for reasons I won't bore you with, the gender of these two is not much of consequence, unlike Aramaiti. They also are always mentioned together in one way or the other, considering they are both attainments, but I will explore them separately. Horvatat is wholeness, and like always represents many different things. As an attainment for humanity, it represents that thing we search for most deeply in life, but we don't know exactly how to describe. It is the state of being entirely complete, whole, or holistic in one's soul. It represents a state where one is completely at peace with himself and the world around them. Yet I feel this doesn't quite capture its true nature. If you have ever had that feeling deep in your soul where everything felt so real, and you felt so connected to yourself and the world, a feeling so magical and sublime, then you know what Horvatat is. It is this feeling, I believe, that we are searching for when we mention the pursuit of happiness. Because happiness can mean so much, and can be many ways. Yet almost anyone understands that this true happiness is different. And this, in essence, is very similar to the Zoroastrian pursuit for wholeness. Wisdom, how shall I, with your agreement and passion you're following, so that my voice might be powerful enough to strive for union with wholeness and immortality, in harmony with that principle that adheres to Asha. Wholeness, however, is most evident in nature. When Mazda Ahura created the universe, he did so via an unfolding of the laws of existence, which began to slowly fashion the universe in which we live. In this unfolding, the laws of existence were not fully realized in some areas as much as others. And by this inequity and unevenness, if that is even the best way to describe it, evil and wrong came about. Yet in this imperfect existence, the drive to fully actualize Asha, while in some areas more corrupted and misactualized than others, is ever present. And shining through the fog of this conflict, the whole of Asha, actualized within individual objects, begins to appear. In everything, this drive to wholeness appears. The whole universe has been so up to this point. We can see this in the many beautiful creations of life, in the universe as magnificent nebulas and galaxies, and in the earth as wonderful canyons, waterfalls, and alike. But this is most evident in the evolutionary aspect of life. In the attempt to become more efficient in surviving, 
The most beautiful and fascinating animal and plant life emerges simply due to its holistic actualization of the laws of the universe. By our own actions, we intentionally or inadvertently actualize wholeness in the environment around us, although our modern hyper-industrialized and disposable world does this less of late. Yet this drive is indeed evident in all of reality, and it's this drive which we are to realize, aid, and actualize fully in order to make this existence whole and new. This is but another way of understanding that directive to perfect existence, which I have mentioned many times up to now. Yet how whole can something be if it will inevitably end, if it will ultimately begin to degrade and regress before dying? This is why immortality and wholeness are always a pair, as conversely, how could anything be immortal if it hasn't fully actualized the order of existence within? Emeritat, immortality, is probably the simplest Amesha Spenta to understand, although it too represents multiple ideas. In the sense of what I just said, immortality is that existence in which Asha has been realized, and the causes of death and end have been eliminated. Many so-called science lovers say that entropy inevitably causes things to end, but this is a very juvenile understanding of entropy. Although I don't have time to explain this fully, entropy is merely the measure of microstates within a macrostate, which eventually increases until the macrostate collapses, although the result is usually something slightly more ordered than the original system. Also, a system in a state of equilibrium never leaves that equilibrium unless acted on by an outside system. So perhaps when existence has been made whole, then will there be no conflict in which to disrupt that equilibrium and the natural regenerative cycle of entropy. Yet this is a very complex issue which needs not be oversimplified, and requires its own video. Nevertheless, we can see Emeritat as a wholly perfected universe in perfect harmony, which exists forever, an endless, ideal existence. For us individuals, it is much trickier to understand. While some at this point may feel that it means physical immortality, Zarathustra repeatedly refers to people entering into states of mind, or consciousness perhaps, after their death. So then Emeritat represents achieving that eternal mental state of existence. Or perhaps, immortality is still a physical thing, one which we will achieve after existence is made best, where we will then have material immortality. I honestly don't know. Perhaps even Zarathustra didn't either. I think at this state of our limited scientific understanding, it is best to just understand it as mental or spiritual immortality, but to still work toward immortality or endlessness for all of reality. As aspects of Lord Wisdom, wholeness and immortality represent the wholeness of its nature and the fact that it is everlasting. It is whole because it has the wholeness of all the Amesha Spentas in it those factors which would perfect existence. It is also whole because Asha has been fully realized within itself, and because it is the ultimate grantor of wholeness. It is immortal for obvious reasons. Mazda existed before the very creation of existence, and was the instigator of this creation. As such, Lord Wisdom is both immortal and the grantor of such. As a pair, Horvata and Emerita are those two forces which give us stability and strength, and are the ultimate attainments we all search after by our good thoughts, words, and deeds. You, grant me immortality and wholeness, those two enduring forces which are to be praised with good thinking. In Zoroastrian theology, Existence is understood as being split between two different forces. Asha, the very order of existence, and Druj, the deception. Yet these two fundamentals are not actual entities capable of enacting their will. They must be chosen or followed. That is, in a human way of understanding it. In a broader, more primal sense, they must be actualized, materialized, or manifested, intentionally or unintentionally. Until the rise of humanity, all this was done unintentionally, simply by all matter in the universe falling down one path or the other. Those pathways being to actualize Asha, or Druj. Moreover, it wasn't Asha that created the universe. 
or Lord Wisdom directly by its own hands. But that pathway to actualize Asha. This leads us to Spinta Mainyu, the final Amesha Spinta, and the very mechanism by which Mazda created existence. The very meaning of the word Mainyu is a mystery in and of itself. Historically, in the modern study of Zoroastrianism, this word was taken to mean spirit, as in the Holy Spirit of Christianity. This was mainly due to an incorrect reading of medieval Zoroastrian texts, which had begun to personalize them. But even in those texts, the word spirit is not nearly as correct as force is, as in force of nature. The word force, or more accurately mental force, is a better translation, but this meaning comes over 2000 years after their original usage. Looking at the word in its original context, that is, how it was used in the Old Avestan language sometime between 2000 and 1000 BCE, Mainyu is mostly agreed to mean mentality or moral disposition. It comes from the root man, to think, and seems to be a derivation of this root meaning mentality or mental disposition. Dina McIntyre, basing her interpretation off of this body of work by modern linguists, says it means mental way of being in every usage of the word. Another scholar, Professor Martin Schwartz, has connected Mainyu to similar words in ancient Greek and Sanskrit that are used to mean an outside sense of rage or anger that would overtake someone. His reconstruction of the word gives it the meaning of impetus, initiation, energy that sets in motion, connecting it to an ancient root word with a similar meaning. The emphasis here seems to be on this outside force that would affect one's mind. My own opinion is that the meaning of anger in Sanskrit and Greek came from its use falling out of favor for everything but anger, hence a later meaning. Overall, Schwartz gives us a rough meaning of mental force or primal impetus. Yet I feel this reconstruction is only a piece of the puzzle and doesn't fit every usage of the word. The reason I mention these two different accounts is I feel they are both a piece of the puzzle in uncovering the meaning of the word. By combining them, the word mind you then means an outside mental force which makes up one's way of being when chosen. This is a lengthy meaning, but entirely normal as far as definitions are concerned. In the English word mentality, a similar meaning can appear in a constrained way. While it mainly is used for the internal and personal, we also understand that one can adopt a mentality by spending time around certain groups of people. It is that second understanding where mentality is similar to mind you. Spinta, as I mentioned earlier, has two different meanings based on different cognates in the Indo-European language family, being either progressive or benevolent. I admit, in most uses the word benevolent makes most sense at the first reading, but when combined with mind you, progressive seems to make more sense. Dina McIntyre, whose paper on this I have left in the description, argues that it could perhaps mean both, and I think this is possible, a sort of expanding benevolence. For the sake of this discussion, let's assume it means both, with a primary meaning of progressive or expanding. Unlike in Christian theology, Lord Wisdom didn't create existence by individually molding and crafting things. It instead designed and created the laws of existence which would order a perfect universe. Yet at the act of creation, how could nothing, at most a random collection of meaningless matter, become this perfect creation? It is by reason of the spent mind you, that outside potential for action, by which the material objects would begin to actualize the order of existence. It is by this that the universe began to progressively evolve to its current state, and the limited perfection of our current existence began to take shape. The spin to mind you is in that overall force that pervades the universe, at least in a certain way of looking at it. It is both chosen by individuals in reality, as well as the ultimate impetus for choice and action. Spin to mind you is in a sense a process or a way of being. It was by this benevolent mentality, for lack of a better translation, by which reality was created. And by choosing to adopt this mentality, would we then be a part of the perfecting process of existence. There is of course the converse, that objects would actualize the deception by falling down the path of the opposite mind you, often called bad, deceitful, 
or a follower of the deception. And this is how reality was meant to be understood. A universe that from its inception was split between two paths of progress and regress. Zarathustra gives us a similar, if enigmatic, account in his own teachings. And now, when these two mentalities first came together, they established both being and non-being, and how the end of existence will be, the worst for the follower of the deception, but for the follower of Asha, the most good mind. Of these two mentalities, that unethical one did choose to actualize the worst. To actualize Asha chose a benevolent mentality, which is clothed in the hardest stones. So too would those who'd satisfy the Lord with true actions continuously to wisdom. While there is a lot to unpack here, what is of most importance in this account is how the two mind views are described as actualizing, a word here meaning to bring to realization or completion. It is because of this very account that I formulated my own interpretation which I have just presented. Yet understanding the spent to mind you is so incredibly important because it is a very method by which wisdom created all of reality. It was the spent to mind you by which Lord Wisdom unfurled and actualized the whole of Asha, by which the progressive and evolutionary aspect of our reality was born and continues to prosper. While Zarathustra's main intentions and his teachings was to inspire people to think and find deeper wisdom by rarely saying things concretely, this is one of the few things he said definitively, which is well demonstrated by a few quotes. By these questions, Wisdom, I am helping to discern you to be the creator of everything by reason of your benevolent mentality. You are the benevolent father of this mentality, the mentality which fashioned the joy-bringing earth for this existence. You, Wisdom, who have fashioned the earth as well as the waters and the plants by reason of your most benevolent mentality. As an attainment for humanity, spent to mind you is that progressive force which pervades all of reality, that way of being which we are to adopt if we are to aid in the perfection of reality. By taking this onto ourselves, we can begin to then aid in the perfection of reality. This is why it is often called the creative force. Because while it is a benevolent mentality we take on ourselves, it is also what allows us to create beautiful and wonderful things. Like I mentioned somewhere way back on this very long script, the good and beautiful things of this world are attainments unto themselves. And by adopting the spent to mind you to create more wonderful things, we are in fact aiding in the perfection of reality. I left spent to mind you for last because it is the very culmination of all six other Amesha spentas, sitting at the top of their pyramid. As an aspect of wisdom, it is what allowed it to progressively create existence. As an Amesha Spenta, it is that force within reality that is incrementally perfecting it. And as an attainment for humanity, it is both that outside force we are to adopt, as well as the creative mentality of all those who have adopted it. As such, it represents the culmination and actualization of all the Amesha Spentas, and the actions done to bring reality closer to its best state a utopia or paradise. In fact, the Avesan word for this best state, Vahishta, which has shown up many times in quotes as well as my own words as best or most good, exists today in modern Persian as Behesht, meaning heaven or paradise. Yet in Zoroastrianism, this isn't a spiritual paradise, but a truly perfected and ideal world. With all seven Amesha Spintas understood, the question of what they all mean still looms high, and is a question which everyone seeking to understand Zoroastrianism struggles with. As I have hinted at before, they are either unique independent entities, aspects of Lord Wisdom, or attainments for humanity. As much as I am inclined to answer this question of what they are for you, this uncertainty lies at the very core of the literature about them, and I am reticent to answer it conclusively. So I will share my own conclusion, one which may indeed change in the end. The Amesha Spentas are hard to understand as concrete entities. In much later times and by a different sect, they began to have concrete descriptions and realms over reality. But this came from Zoroastrians who had a highly syncretic belief system, which included many of the old deities from their previous pantheon. 
Yet in the works of Zarathustra and his immediate followers, they are really hard to understand as concrete entities. While only occasionally being personified for poetic effect, understanding their true meanings and implications makes it very hard to see that as anything but poetic. Here they are best understood as the aspects of Lord Wisdom, emanating outward so humanity can emulate its creator in making the world best. Of the seven, only the order of existence and the creative mentality can be understood as actual entities in existence with only the mentality having anything close to true agency. The rest are simply mental traits or states of being, yet even the creative mentality is often described as belonging to Lord Wisdom. I think the best way to understand them is as an in-depth system in achieving the best things, and making reality perfect, an idea I will forever be indebted to Dina for. This is what they truly are, and it is why they are considered the aspects of Lord Wisdom. As Mazda was the original one who wished to make perfect this reality, it was those aspects of it which enabled it to create this reality on the path of perfection. A reality in which those aspects are still attainable for those within to aid in this process. The ultimate Amesha Spenta is of course Spenta Mainyu, a way of being which encompasses all others and aids in the perfection of the world. While many of the Amesha Spentas are evident in nature, it was only by living beings in existence following Spenta Mainyu, often inadvertently, that the others began to appear. With this, we have a greater understanding of Ahura Mazda, the creator of everything, and we have a comprehensive system for making this world best. And while it wasn't my intention in writing this script initially, I have learned, along with you all, that the true beauty of the Amesha Spentas is that they reveal how the universe was created in a metaphysical sense. A word here meaning that philosophical field which covers the greater meaning of things, not the word meaning spiritual. We also have learned the ultimate source of things. While I have been using the meaning of order of existence for Asha, which is a very literal meaning, Asha most simply meant truth in their society. Their idea of truth being that which orders reality. And by this, we realize how, who was likely the first philosopher on record, Zarathustra, proved that truth is the ultimate source for all of creation. For certain, the ultimate source of all reality is truth, and the actualization of it. And the ultimate creator of truth is wisdom, the benevolent creator of existence, whose seven aspects allow us to understand its nature and renovate existence. Thank you so much for watching this video. It took an enormous amount of effort to write and edit. If you've watched this video without watching my previous one, I hope this was easy enough to follow. I tried my best to make this understandable, but I would still highly recommend my previous video, which gives a more holistic approach to Zoroastrianism and the teachings of Zarathustra. I highly encourage you to comment if that is within your will, as I love seeing and responding to comments. I hate to be a YouTuber, but consider liking and subscribing as that will help this and other videos spread. I had a number of setbacks in the recording of the audio, which ended up taking me 3-4 to four times longer to record than it would have otherwise. This includes consulting a pronunciation guide which was incorrect, and having to completely re-record the first half. I have included some sources for the linguistic claims in the description, but the vast majority of this video was my own analysis of the Gathas of Zarathustra. I hope that, even though this is in video format, it can still be treated as a primary source for understanding the teachings of Zarathustra. If you are interested in the script for reference or other purposes, email me and I'll send you one. If you have gotten to this point, thank you for listening so long, especially for this dry outro. I appreciate your presence, and maybe I'll see you in the comments.